All right. Um, okay, let's get this. Let's get this started. Uh, welcome everyone to Basecamp. Um, and great to see uh, old members, new members, and those of you that are joining us for the first time. We're we're excited to have you here, and very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, we have a very special guest today, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, who I couldn't be more excited about and honored to have with us. Um, Dr. Barrett is, um, I think. Uh, you know, to lead with maybe her most impressive, um, most impressive accolade as a mother first. Um, I know this from having a, a wife with a, a few young kids that um, that is probably one of the most demanding things and most impressive. So uh, Dr. Lisa Barrett is a mother. Um, she is one of the top, uh, maybe in the top 1% of scientists often cited for her revolutionary work in the fields of psychology and um, neuroscience. She's, uh, she's a distinguished professor at Northeastern University with appointments at Mass General and Harvard Med School, to Guggenheim Fellow. She's an author of both uh, How Emotions Are Made, uh, which I have a copy of here that I stole from Andrew Huberman. Andrew, I promise I'll return it. And uh, most recently, Seven and a Half Lessons of the Brain. And it probably wrote what will you know, what truly is a seminal paper and theory on uh, the theory of constructed emotion, which we'll dive into today. So uh, Dr. Barrett, welcome and uh, excited for this conversation. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Amazing, amazing. Well, um, I won't pretend that we'll be able to cover all of your work today. Um, I know your research is vast, um, but I think it is so important. So I wanna to try to tie a few aspects of it together in a way that ultimately allows our members and listeners um, to walk away from this with something that they can action, something that they can um, feel like they have a better sense of control in their life and that they can put into practice uh, to live better and to, to bring their best to the world. And I thought maybe an interesting place to start would just be to, to first talk about the emotion paradox and something that you address with your, your theory and your paper. Maybe you could just frame up for us what an, the emotion paradox is um, and how that has informed the work that you do. Sure. Well, when I was a graduate student, which was uh, longer ago than I care to admit, uh, I noticed that um, on the one hand, there is no objective marker for any emotion category. So, you know, we have these very distinct experiences, anger, sadness, fear, awe, uh, gratitude, you know, people vary in how distinct those experiences are, but to some extent, you know, there's some distinctiveness there, but there's no biological marker or behavioral marker that objectively tells you what emotional state someone's in. And so I thought, well, how does that work exactly? So you can't look at someone's face, you can't measure anything about their body, you can't measure a single thing about their brain or face or body and have it tell you, or their voice or what have you, or ha have, have it tell you what state they're in. You can't even combine those things and necessarily know what state they're in. There's no single marker for each category. So how is it that we have these very distinct experiences? How could I look at somebody else, you know, look at their face and make a very automatic, you know, judgment of what they're feeling, you know, read their body language or read their face if there are no objective markers? And that is a question we've been trying to answer in my lab for, well, I'll just say the last 30 years. So it's been about 30 years that we've been working on this problem. Wow, wow. And so so basically it's this idea that um, we think we know an emotion when we see it, but oftentimes we're wrong. So we may see someone react in a certain way or see, see what a marker would be for what we would attribute to anger, fear, sadness, whatever, but generally we're wrong or oftentimes are wrong. Yeah, so Pat, it's even more complicated than that mm -hmm. because let's say, um, uh, let's say you are experiencing uh, gratitude, you're experiencing gratitude, or let's take actually a classic emotion that there's both that, you know, there were claims about, you know, these markers, right? So you're, you're experiencing fear, okay? And I look at you and I don't see fear. I see um, anger, okay? 
we can ask, does your experience match my perception? But we can't compare your experience to anything objective or my perception to anything objective that is independent of, of perceiver. I can't peer into your body or into your brain and find evidence that yes, indeed, you are experienced, you are actually in a fearful state or no, you're not, you're actually in an angry state. There's no way to adjudicate who's right there. It's not that um, it's not that people haven't looked. It's actually the wrong question to be asking because there is no single marker or pattern of markers for any emotion category. That's just not what emotions are. It's not how they work. Um, but, uh, you know, and the, right now there's a whole big, uh, you know, push in industry. Um, I think it's a, I think the emotion AI industry is worth something like $25 billion a year or something with all of these companies claiming that they can read emotion and other people's faces and stuff. And um, that's just, a profound misunderstanding um, of what emotions are and how they work. It's actually not, it's just not true, actually. <laughs> so, so if emotions aren't um, hardwired into us and they're not universal, how are they constructed? We come into this world, babies, I know you've described our brains as um, they're incomplete or not fully formed and they, they are formed through our experience over time. Maybe could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, when an infant is born, an infant brain is not a miniature adult brain. It's a brain that is uh, has to finish wiring itself in quite substantial ways. And uh, those wiring instructions come from the world. So, uh, you know, for many, you know, more than many decades, many centuries, there was a debate about nature versus nurture. You know, um, are we creatures that um, are hard, you know, hardwired by our genes or um, do we come into the world, um, you know, like a blank slate and we learn everything? And the answer is neither one of those things is actually the case. Um, instead, we have the kind of nature that requires nurture. We have the kind of genes that require experiences in order for a brain to finish wiring itself. Some of those experiences come from uh, the infant's own body. You know, so for example, your brain is wired to see specifically out of two eyes that are the exact distance of your eyes, right? So when, you're, when you were born, you couldn't see actually. Babies don't, when newborns can't see very well actually at all. And it takes about three or four months for their visual systems to finish wiring in themselves. And partly, you know, you have two eyes and they have slightly different views on the world. You can see that by just, if you close one eye and close the other eye, you can see that the perspective changes slightly. What's happening at the brain, level of the brain is those two perspectives are being merged into one, specifically for the distance between your eyes. So if we took your brain and stuck it in somebody else's body, there'd be a problem unless they had exactly the same distance between the eyes as you do. Your brain is wired for you to hear out of, you know, it's wired to the particular shape of your ear, right? And if that, if your ear changes shape because you have an injury or something, you will hear less well until your brain readjusts itself. Um, so the wiring instructions come from the infant's own body. The wiring instructions come from the world. Right? So usually infants, when they're born, are their circadian rhythms are turned around. They have to learn when to sleep and when to be awake. Um, uh, and so, you know, that also wires the, an infant, but also there's social interactions with infants that, that are necessary to wire the brains. Talking to infants, cuddling infants, keeping them comfortable, um, you know, sharing attention with them. All of these things are really important to, um, uh, for an infant brain to uh, wire itself normally in a neurotypical way, I should say. And that wiring takes about 25 years to complete. And even after it's completed, our brains are still wiring in themselves to our world. It's just the wiring is, it just happens more slowly. So with little kids, it's, you know, brains are very, very plastic and the wiring happens very, very, can, can shift around very, very quickly. Um, but not in adulthood. And so things do, so when someone asks the question, is our emotions hardwired into your brain? That's a, 
what they're really asking is, are our emotions innate? That is, do they do they come preformed in the brain? Because as your brain wires itself to its world, it, your brain is becoming hardwired to your world, right? So, um, you know, if you grow up in an, in a culture like ours, where there are buildings and boxes and things with right angles, you'll have depth perception uh, in a particular way that somebody who grows up without those, without boxes and and um, edges and so on. Um, and you can see this, uh, you know, in different, um, there are different visual illusions that we have that like Zulu, uh, you know, people who, who, um, who are from the Zulu, well, this was back in the 1960s when these experiments were done in Africa, um, who live in huts and don't have boxes and things, you know, they didn't have those illusions, whereas they have illusions that we don't because our visual systems are wired very, very um, differently with respect to these um, kinds of features. And so things do get wired into our brains from our culture via the way that we interact with each other. That's called cultural inheritance. Um, but there's a difference between something and you know, a circuit being there already in your brain and not requiring experience to develop versus being hardwired into your brain by experience. Mm -hmm. So um, I, think that, I think that's fascinating that this, this idea that one, everything that we perceive in the world is unique to not only to our experience, but to our specific conditions and the way that even anatomically, the way that our eyes are positioned or the way that our ears are, are structured, that our experience or our interpretation of the sensory signals that are coming in is unique to us. And I know oftentimes um, you talk about this, uh, this, this concept of we have this internal model that gets constructed over time. And so the more that we experience and that we have culturally relevant experiences and the, the way that our parents interact with us, that our model is getting built out and we're developing our niche in the world in terms of how we have these experiences and how they fit together and how we can most efficiently move through the world. Maybe could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it, I think it's just such a, a really interesting point of this internal model, and then we're gonna we're gonna transition at some point to how our models um, how they bump into other uh, models for for other people and how we can do that maybe even better. Sure. So. To us, it feels like we see things in the world, we see things, we hear things, and then we react to them. Maybe we think about them first and then we react to them. But the idea is that we're being probed by things in the world that we react to. You see a snake, you know, it triggers your fear circuit, you jump back in fear. Um, but that's actually not how things work. Uh, instead, really what's happening is that you, your brain is, trapped in a dark silent box called your skull and it's receiving sense data from the sensory surfaces of your body so light waves from your retina of your eye and air changes in air frequency air pressure frequency in, in, from your cochlea in your ear and um you know there are chemical um chemicals that are received by your by your um, olfactory bulb in your nose and your you know the taste buds in your tongue and so on and your your brain receives these sense data which are the outcomes of some set of causes but your brain doesn't know what the causes are it only receives the outcomes this is what philosophers call an inverse problem so if you hear a loud bang what is it is it a car backfiring? Is it thunder? Uh, so there's an imminent storm. It, did someone drop something on the floor? Is it a gunshot? It really could be any of those things. So how does your brain know what to do next to keep you alive and well? If it can't, it doesn't know the what the cause is, it's only receiving the outcomes of some change in the world. Similarly, your brain's always receiving sense data from your body tugs and squishes and you know changes in glucose and like all of these um changes that are being the sensory information is being sent back to your brain but like for example when you have a tug in your chest or you have indigestion is that because you know or like a searing sort of pain in in your chest is that you know indigestion from being uh overeating is it 
um, anxiety? Is it uh, the beginnings of a heart attack? Your brain doesn't know. It just receives the outcomes and then it has to guess at what the causes are. And those guesses are really important. I'll just say that, you know, one of the leading um, causes of there, women over the age of 65 die more frequently from heart attacks than men do in large part because they go to the emergency room and they complain of symptoms that are um, of anxiety and their uh, the emergency room physicians also um, interpret their um, their uh, symptom reports as anxiety send them home and then they die of a heart attack and this actually I know I know three people personally know three people who this happened where this happened to their mothers and a good friend of mine had something like this happen to him almost but because he's a man they didn't send him home and he had a massive coronary right in the right in front of the cardiologist in and that's what saved his life actually but if he had been a woman they would have sent him home already and he would have died and you can hear that story on circle of willis it's a podcast um it's a halloween um edition from a number of years ago and actually uh, the reason the only reason why he went to the emergency room was because uh, we had a conversation almost a year before that about this exact thing that your brain's always guessing and you can be wrong about the causes of sensations. So, um, but, but how is your, so what is your brain using to guess? And the answer is it's using the only information it has, which is your past experience. And so in any given moment, when you're faced with all this sense data, your brain is using your past to try to guess at what's going to happen next your brain's asking itself what is similar in my past to this array of um, sense data that i'm receiving right now what did i do the last time uh that um i you know that this these sense data were here what did i feel what did i see what did i hear and then your brain actually begins to construct those experiences for you and prepare those actions and if you're wrong it attempts to learn the um, the new information that you didn't predict, um, and psychologists and other scientists refer to this constant predicting as an internal model. Your brain is running a model of your body in the world, and it's using that model to create your experiences and control your actions. And the really, Pat, I think the really cool thing about this is that. Um, if your when your brain makes a prediction of what's going to happen next based on past experience it's not some kind of abstract prediction it's that your brain's actually changing the firing of its own neurons to actually begin to prepare for the sense data that it's expecting to arrive in the next moment and if that sense data ar arrives and confirms the firing that's that's in the brain that's as far as the information gets because it's not needed anymore because your brain's already, your neurons are firing already in a pattern to capture that information. So your experience is completely based on your internal model. The external information is only there to confirm that model. It's the, when information makes its, its way into our brain, it's because we have to adjust that internal model we have to update that model for a new experience that we couldn't predict. And we have a fancy name for that in science. We call it learning. <laughs> what learning is. I love it. That's amazing. It, just hearing hearing you talk about that reminds me of something. And, and I don't know why I never connect this before, but the first time that I was deployed um, overseas, and I know you, you have a story about a, a, a young Rhodesian soldier who had a, a similar experience where he was on patrol and he, he saw uh, someone walking um, through the through the woods uh, carrying a rifle and he was getting ready to shoot this person. And then someone tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, hey that's a that's a child uh, just hurting some sheep and he's got a staff. And so that was an example of where his internal model and his the actual what was happening in his environment, there was a mismatch there. Fortunately, he had an opportunity to 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 insert. Yeah, exactly. That. That's actually that's a true story. And you know, sometimes your model basically doesn't update. So sometimes your brain decides I'm not going to learn this new information. And um, there are a number of reasons for that. But the story that you're talking about, this Rhodesian soldier, um, is is a true story. And this guy wrote to me after reading how emotions are made, um, and he 
his email, I was reading his email as I was getting off an airplane and I was so captivated by his email that I stopped in the middle of the aisle. Like I have all these people behind me and I just, I'm frozen and tears are running down my face as I'm reading this guy's email to me. And his email was basically for, for years, I've wondered what is wrong with me, my brain. Like what, you know, before, uh, before apartheid fell, he was a lawyer who was defending freedom fighters in Rhodesia. Mm. And then he was drafted. And then he had to actually fight against the very people that he was defending only days before. And um, he was, and he had very little, um, you know, military training before that. And he had never, you know, shot a rifle before learned before he was drafted. And he was out in the woods with his, um, his unit and he was in front and he saw uh um um you know a bunch of gorillas with ak what he thought were ak-47s and um he actually without thinking about it raised the rifle flipped off the safety switch you know took aim had his finger on the trigger and was about to pull and you know one of his um buddies tapped him on the shoulder and said don't shoot it's a little boy hmm. and it was a little boy with a bunch i'm getting shivers actually just talking about it and, you know, I had to say to him, well, nothing's wrong with your brain. Your brain is working exactly the way brains work, which is um, everything you see, everything you hear, every action you take, your brain starts to construct it before the information is actually there. If that wasn't true, we would not have baseball, football, soccer, any kind of ball sport would not be possible. I have to tell you that, you know, I mean, I grew up in Toronto you know, the home of the great, you know, Toronto Maple Leafs, great hockey team. And I now currently live in Boston, you know, Red Sox, great baseball team. I have no interest in sports until about, you know, five years ago when I realized, oh my God, what's happening here is that, okay, so you've got a batter and a pitcher and the batter actually has to be predicting, not like consciously, gee, I wonder where the pitcher is going to throw. No, his brain is making a prediction based on about the exact muscle contractions that are required based on not just his experience with this pitcher, but the bat, the heaviness of the bat, the windiness of the area, how much sleep he got, how much glucose is in his muscles. His brain is making a prediction and he starts to lift the bat and swing for where he predicts the ball will be in a moment from now. He can't wait um, to see the ball if he waits he will have zero chance of swinging and hitting the ball because it takes longer for him to for his brain to prepare motor movement than the ball you know and this is very relevant for much of what I mean, it is very relevant for the military obviously um but it's also really relevant to the whole situation that we're in with um policing and um the shooting of, of unarmed civilians yeah, I, I, you know, to, even to come back to the, the Rhodesian um, soldier, again, I, I was on my first deployment and was on one of the, the first times I was on a target, I was running through a building and um, chasing someone that was running away and went up these stairs and um, went up two flights of stairs and my heart was beating and opened this door and went out fully expecting to um, encounter and to, to have a fight. And when I came through that door, um, there, the, the the man that I was chasing uh, was standing in front of two families, and there were in in Iraq a lot of families sleep on the rooftops at night because it gets so hot in the house and it's so hot during the day, and so he just wanted to get up there and to protect his family, and so he was had his arms stretched out, and there was an old woman coming towards me, and she was screaming, and everyone was yelling, and um, when when you were telling this this story of these internal models and our past experiences helping inform what we're actually experiencing now, I was reminded that. In the, over the course of training prior to that deployment, we did something called a, a hooded box drill where we would basically stand in a room and someone would drop a black box over our head and they would lift the block, lift the box up and you would have to respond to whatever the whatever the situation was. And there were times where someone would be there with a gun or someone was charging at you and you know getting ready to hit you. Other times it would be um, a woman was starting to like just ask you for directions for for a bus. And so you were 
we're in many ways conditioning ourselves for that very moment when I went up to that rooftop and I, I was able to insert a, enough of a pause to say, hey, here, are, there's a lot of potential scenarios here. Let's not default to just one that this, you know, the person on this roof is, wants to get in a gunfight. Rather, there's some other things that I could draw upon. Unfortunately, I had that experience to do that. So right. I, thought, I thought you that might sounds really that. that sounds really challenging, but I also want to say that Normally, we think about curiosity as, um, you know, foraging for information and kind of looking into things carefully and whatever, but the ability to train your brain to make multiple predictions and actually not settle on one mm. is, is actually a form of curiosity. So when you're interacting with someone and you're very sure that that person is being disrespectful to you or is in love with you or you know whatever it is that you're very very sure you're you don't really know for sure no matter how certain you are you don't know you're guessing we don't read body language because because body movements aren't a language there is no physical signal in your body not your movements not your facial movements not your tone of voice nothing not your heart rate, no physical signal has uh, inherent psychological meaning. You make it meaningful. You do it without awareness, very, very quickly, quicker than the blink of an eye, literally. Um, but you're using your past experience. You're running a model of your world. And that's what you're doing. So, you know, I uh, when I was training, I am actually a trained psychotherapist. I haven't practiced in really in 30 years, but I, you know, when I was a graduate student, I was considered a very, very good therapist. And I, for two years, worked with um, girls who had been sexually abused as children. And so now they're college students and they, you would, you would not imagine that this is a very common thing, but it's actually very common. It's like one in four women actually have a adverse sexual experiences as children, at, which is shocking. If you're not shocked by that, I mean, I was shocked by that. But I would listen to these young women and I would, and I didn't have the language that I have now, obviously. But what I was aware of is that they were false alarming, that they were using, I would, what I would say now is that they were, now these, these are young women who were struggling okay so the ones who weren't struggling i didn't see because they didn't come into the clinic but these were young women who were struggling and they were struggling because they were using a model uh, an internal model of the world of their environment that hadn't updated and so they were so the only way for them to update their model was to get more information so that they would have to actually check now that's one thing that psychotherapy is good for because you can say to your therapist well are you mad at me right now like are you do you, you know do you hate me right now do you you know like you can ask and then your therapist because it's a safe space will say no <laughs> not at all um but how do you do that in everyday life like can you just go up to your and say I, I'm feeling like something's wrong are you are you okay I mean do you hate me right now you know did I do something to bother you if you do that enough times people are gonna you know think that you're a bit of a burden and not want to be your friend so the interesting thing is that when you live in adverse circumstances if your brain guesses there's a threat and the base rate of threat is hot is like is high you're you know, if you guess it's a threat all the time, sure, you'll false alarm occasionally, but you'll also, you won't miss any threats. And that's important because you can try to prepare. Although when you're a kid, you know, I don't know what you can do, but still, you know, you can try to prepare. But when you go to a safe environment and you're using the same model, your false alarm rate goes through the roof. And that isn't just, there isn't, aren't just social problems with that. Every time your brain prepares your body, mobilizes your body for a threat, it's expensive metabolically. And you also pay a little extra tax metabolically for preparing for a threat that doesn't arrive. And when that happens enough times, it actually um, makes it harder and harder and harder for your brain to regulate your body systems, the internal systems of your body, which is actually is its main job. 
And so you can, I like to talk about this meta, it's a metaphor for something complicated called allostasis, which means that the brain regulates your body the same way that it regulates your actions and prepares your experience. It's attempting to anticipate the needs of the body in the next moment and meet those needs before they arrive. So where does glucose have to be? Where does oxygen have to be? Where does water have to be? And so on and so forth. And of course, you don't experience every hug you give and every insult you bear in this way, but that is actually what's happening. Cortisol, not a stress hormone, not a stress hormone, big myth. Cortisol is a, is a, is a glucocorticoid. It's a, it's a chemical that is released into your bloodstream when your brain believes that you have a big metabolic outlay. So when you drag your self out of bed in the morning, right before you get up, big cortisol release. Before you exercise, big cortisol release. Before you do something really fun that requires metabolic energy, big cortisol release. I mean, basically anytime your brain believes that there's a big effort that you have to make either to learn something new, right? To correct your model or to move your body, big cortisol release. The problem is that if you have that cortisol release over and over and over and over again, your cells become insensitive to it and it doesn't work as a signal anymore. And that is in its own right, metabolically expensive because you're, the, predictive, the predictive mechanisms don't work anymore. And that makes it more expensive for your brain to regulate your body. And so I always talk about this as a budget, You know, your brain's running a budget for your body and it's not budgeting money it's budgeting all these nutrients and and things and you can think about deposits and withdrawals and so on you can use this metaphor and you can also think about what happens over time when your internal model is not working well you start to run a deficit when it needs to be updated you're going to make a big metabolic outlay but do you have the uh, energy to invest in that big metabolic outlay if you're running a deficit, it's hard, it becomes harder and harder and harder for you to learn to, to update your model for your, your brain to learn what it needs to learn. And eventually, you know, you'll um, become sick with a metabolic illness. And that includes vulnerability to heart disease, vulnerability to diabetes, depression. I mean, depression is basically a bankrupt body budget. And over the long run, you know, when, when I say you pay a tax, I mean a little tax, like, like a tiny tax each time, but it adds up over time. So, so you know, a not, if your internal model is not well calibrated to the actual niche that you inhabit, that is the world that you live in, it will be more metabolically expensive for you for your brain to regulate your body. And over the long term, you will be more vulnerable to metabolic illness. And even, you know, something like Alzheimer's disease or dementia is um, has a metabolic basis because what's happening is the some of the cells, I mean, this is really an oversimplification, okay? But basically, what do you do when you're when you're actually running a deficit in your actual bank account? usually you stop spending. What does it mean to stop spending? Well, it means you stop moving your body very much, you get fatigued, and you, you stop learning, you become insensitive to your context. And if that doesn't reduce the deficit, you start getting rid of stuff that are really expensive, like neurons. And that's dementia, basically. Hmm. Now, I just really oversimplified, right? There's all sorts of other things going on in dementia, but they all, all of them can be traced back to metabolic, you know, some kind of underlying metabolic function. So, so to, to put up even higher level summary on this, so that the brain exists to anticipate and meet the metabolic needs of our body, to regulate our, our resources, to make sure we have what we need to effectively move through our environment, to grow, and probably at some point to procreate. Um, that's the reason we have the brain. And if we're running deficits or if there's inefficiencies with our internal model and the external environment that we find ourselves in, that comes at a cost. Um, either too many resources or too few resources. In the short run, it means maybe there's opportunities for learning or there's some inefficiency. 
over the long run, that's going to have a cost for us. The cost is, and I, I love that you, you kind of combine these two in that physical illnesses and mental illnesses ultimately at a foundational level have the same um, basis in that there is a metabolic inefficiency that's played out over time. Exactly. I mean, you know, physicians turn themselves inside out asking, well, why, why is the, co why is there such high comorbidity between cardiovascular disease and depression? Like, what is it about depression that makes people vulnerable to cardiovascular disease? Or what is it about cardiovascular disease that causes depression? No, that's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is that there's a common cause there. And the common cause is there's some metabolic problem. And the thing is that it's very complicated because when I say some metabolic problem, I mean, that could be a lot of different things, right? But one possibility is that there is actually a problem in your body, maybe with the efficiency of your heart, or maybe you have a lot of plaque, or maybe your mitochondria aren't functioning well, or maybe you have tissue damage, or maybe you know you injured yourself, and or and it hasn't healed, or an infection, or maybe you know you're there's something wrong with your immune system, which is a very expensive, uh, metabolically expensive system. So you know lots of or maybe you know you're not sleeping enough, or drinking enough water, or eating healthfully. All of these things can actually cause actual real metabolic problems in the body. But it's also possible that your brain believes there's a metabolic problem and it's not learning that there, that problem isn't there anymore. And that is, that's what chronic pain is, for example. Chronic pain is, you know, people say, oh, you know, chronic pain is in your head and that's not an insult. It is in your head. It's in your brain. Like every other experience you have, everything you experience is in your brain. Everything you see, you see with your brain, you, you hear with your brain, you feel with your brain, you have an orgasm, you're feeling it in your brain. Everything you feel is in your brain. And when you feel pain, you also feel pain in your brain. It, your brain has the ability to make it appear as if it's happening somewhere in your body, but it is actually in your brain. And so if the brain, you know, let's say you have tissue damage, you, you're injured and that's very, very expensive, metabolically speaking, to repair tissue. And for whatever reason, that um, deficit makes it hard for the brain to recalibrate. Maybe you're alone. Maybe you have other stressors in your life. Maybe, you know, there are all sorts of things which can add to the burden of, um, of, a, of a human body budget. Then your brain won't update itself and it will continue to believe that there is tissue damage and you will feel intense pain even though there's no tissue damage anymore and that is one very strong possibility of what um you know of what chronic pain is and so when you know in our lab we're trying to understand versions of depression you know like like there are many paths to a bankrupt body budget and we're trying to understand what they are and one you know, one thing that's interesting is so um, serotonin, you know, the, the, the major drug that people take for um, depression is a serotonin um, uptake inhibitor. So it leaves ser this chemical serotonin in your synapses between your, the, the neurons where they communicate to each other. And people think about serotonin, you know, as like a happiness, like chemical or something. It's a metabolic regulator. It actually regulates adipose tissue in your body, like fat cells in your body. I mean, it's it evolved as as a metabolic regulator. So SSRIs, these these drugs that people take for some people, the drugs work, but for a time and then they stop working. And for other people, they work pretty well over the long run. So we think that it's possible that, you know, SSRIs, these serotonin drugs may if you take serotonin, it will give you more energy in the short run. But if you are running, a if you have a body budget deficit and you make the brain believe that there's more energy than there is, you're just further driving that system into deficit. And that may be one reason why a large proportion of people never recover from depression.
it's a lingering problem for a very long time because the drugs that they're taking actually might be prolonging the symptoms and making it worse like a short-term gain but over a but over the long run you're just making the deficit harder to correct basically whereas for if the brain really if the body is fine and the brain just has to be updated then you know you're basically it's like drinking coffee you know you're borrowing energy from tomorrow to kind of get through today so you know you just the brain will spend a little more it'll update itself and then you know you'll be able to get yourself back on the the brain gets itself back on a kind of a neurotypical uh trajectory again oh wow that's that's so powerful i something that 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 stands out for me is this idea that if we're running a deficit then that implies that we're not able to update our internal model if we don't have a capacity for it's harder it's harder, harder. So yeah. we, we lack maybe empathy or curiosity or just an awareness to tune our sensory um, uh, our, our sensory experience to a, to a place that can help us navigate the environment uh, efficiently or effectively. Um, but if we do tend to our body budget and we are, um, and from, from what you were saying, there's very simple things that we can do. And, and these are all obviously things that, that we talk a lot about in, inside this community of making sure you're rested, making sure you're moving your body, even uh, cultivating an orientation to recognize and celebrate the good um, in, in your environment to being hydrated. These very simple things add to your body budget um, and give you, uh, give you the capacity to update your internal models so that you can effectively engage yeah. with others throughout your day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, sometimes when I'm giving a talk or I'm giving a lecture, public lecture, people will say, well, if I, if I wanna ha have better control over my mood or, you know, like what's the one thing I can do if I just have one thing and I'll be like, sleep. Just had one thing, sleep. If you have two things, sleep and hydrate properly. If you wanna go for three things, eat healthfully, take a walk every day. Like, you know, I mean, I know, and I say, you know, I know I sound like I'm a mother now. I'm, I'm, you know, believe me when I tell you that when I say these things to my daughter, she's not happy, you know, she's, but I'm actually speaking as a neuroscientist that we don't experience our, we don't experience directly the um, energetic state of our own bodies. We experience the state of our body budget as mood, or in, in science, we call it affect, feeling pleasant, feeling unpleasant, feeling worked up, feeling calm, feeling comfortable, feeling uncomfortable. If you wake up in the morning and you feel like crap, it could be that you're, you know, you didn't sleep well. It could be that you're dehydrated. It could be that you just need to get out of your bed and stretch a little bit, you know, I'm not trying to say that um, I'm not trying to simplify real suffering and distress and say, say, you know, all you have to do is like drink a bit of water and, you know, you know, like sleep well and then it will all go away. I'm not saying that at all because it's actually really, really hard to get a body budget back on track, but it is doable. People do it. You, you have to, you know, it takes much longer than we all would like it to take, um, but there are ways to do it. And um, and the taking care of the basic needs of the body um, make it um, easier for the brain to do what it needs to do, which basically is to learn. And so I know it seems crazy, but like, here's just a really small example. So if, for example, when you get your teeth fit, you know, like if you ever had like a filling fix or you have a tooth pulled, right? And all of a sudden there are, there's like, you know, something in your mouth that wasn't there before or something that was there that's no longer there. And so your tongue keeps kind of like probing at it, probing at it, probing at it. So, you know, maybe people have had this experience but going to the dentist, right? Or, and what's happening is your brain is foraging for information because eventually you won't feel it anymore. That filling or that tooth or whatever, it will just go away. So, for, you know, I just, I had back surgery. I had major back surgery in May and I knew that what this meant was that at some point after the swelling goes down and you know that I was going to have sensations I've never had before because I have titanium rods in my back now. And sure enough, I have these sensations and I'm like, is that pain? 
is that a problem? Is that okay? Keep, and then I have to tell myself, I have to tell myself, I study this for a living. I have to tell myself, I have actually signs up on my computer. Be curious, like don't, you know, be curious. Um, you know, yesterday I emailed my surgeon, like, I'm trying to be curious. Can you tell me if this is a problem? And he's like, you know, I told you, know, basically I'm having some, you know, some, uh, stiffness in my back and he's like well, what are you doing and i'm like well i'm riding my peloton every day for 45 minutes and i'm walking three miles and i'm taking a yoga class every day and i'm like doing all these things and he's like i told you not to do anything that you know was uncomfortable and i'm like well i'm not doing anything that's uncomfortable and he's like but you are and i'm like oh right right i am and that's why I'm emailing you to ask you this question, you know, so it's some, sometimes things are right in front of your face and you just don't somebody you have to point out to you look prediction error learn it right so now I'm resting and I'm only walking three miles a day and I'm not riding my peloton every day for 45 minutes. Um, but the, the point is that you know I knew that there was a risk of chronic pain chronic pain after back surgery is very common because because you're in, you're running a deficit because you have tissue damage and it's hard for the brain to update itself and if you avoid putting yourself in situations where you feel uncomfortable your brain can't learn that it's not pain it's just a new sensation that it has to learn and then eventually will cancel out just like you probing you know your your filling or your tooth or whatever with your tongue and so we can do that in everyday life. We can um, create in situations for ourselves where we learn. It's like an investment in a better, healthier you, just like exercise is an investment in a better, healthier you. You invest the energy to cultivate a new experience and then you learn from it. And then that updates your model. And if you practice it enough, your brain starts to use that information automatically to predict in the future. I feel like this is, this is a perfect segue to, I think one of the most powerful things that comes from, comes out of your work, which is this idea that um, we regulate each other's nervous systems for good and for bad. And so uh, with that comes not only um, great opportunity, but also great responsibility. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit sure. about that. Yeah, this is one of the, you know, this is one of the reasons why I wrote seven and a half lessons about the brain. It's just a little book of essays. And it has just, you know, each essay is very quick to read. And, and it's got like just a little tidbit of neuroscience in there so that you can like impress your friends at dinner parties, you know, like when we used to have dinner parties. <laughs> for COVID. Um, but it links these little tidbits of neuroscience to big questions about human nature. And it doesn't really tell you what to think about human nature. It just, it just asks you to, the essays ask you to think about what kind of human you wanna be. You know, who, what kind of human are you? And what kind of human do you wanna be? And one of the essays, as Pat, as you're suggesting, is that it's really about how we, we are, we are a social species. Humans are a social species. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we are the caretakers of each other's nervous systems in ways that are quite profound. So we can, metaphorically speaking, make deposits or withdrawals into other people's body budgets. And this is, in the United States, a very contentious thing to say because we live in a culture that prioritizes individual rights and freedoms. And so how do you negotiate that when we have these highly dependent nervous systems where the words that you speak literally can cause biological changes in another person. So, you know, I can text three words to a close friend of mine halfway around the world. She doesn't have to hear my voice or see my face. I can change her heart rate, her metabolism, her breathing rate, just with three words, right? And so, we really affect each other. The best thing for a human nervous system is another human. The worst thing for a human nervous system is another human. 
right? If I want to stress somebody in the lab, so what is stress? It's just your brain preparing your body for a big metabolic outlay. If I want to stress someone in the lab, I can show them negative images, um, you know, for half an hour and maybe I'll get them to the point where, you know, they're starting to feel unpleasant. They're starting to feel it a little, you know, or I can just subtly disapprove of them for about two minutes and poof, it's there. You know, you can, I can get that response really, really very, very reliably. As reliably as having someone run on a treadmill, you know, to the point of, um, you know, where they uh, are building up lactic acid. So we influence each other and we can influence each other. We can make it easier to, um, for, for our fellows to, you know, manage a body budget, or we can make it harder. So, you know, why is it that people who are lonely or socially isolated die earlier than people who aren't? And they do. This is well established, not debatable. I mean, like, it's very clear. Why? Because we didn't evolve as a species to manage our body budgets on our own. You pay an extra tax for that. Why is it when you lose someone that you love, you feel it like you feel it like you feel like you've lost a part of yourself. And it's because you have you lost someone who tended your body budget and now you feel it. And you have to your brain has to learn has to adjust to that loss. Until you don't feel it anymore because there's prediction error there. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, you know, I was born alone and I'll die alone. And I always think, really, your mother wasn't there in the emergency, you know, like wherever she delivered you, no mother there. Now, babies aren't born alone and die alone. If a, ba a baby can't manage their own body budget, that's what caregivers do. That's what your that's your whole purpose, basically, as a caregiver. And how do you do that with a baby? Well, sure, you water and feed the baby, you know, like you, you make sure it's you know, got food and water and, you know, make sure it's warm and, 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 you know, or cool enough, dry and whatever, and sure, you do all those things. But you know, there are very, very, very unfortunate kind of natural experiments that have been done. Um, I mean, we'd never, no one would ever run an experiment like this on purpose, but you know, where children are warehoused in, um, in, in institutions in orphanages where their physical needs are met but no one talks to these babies. Nobody plays with these babies. Nobody sings to them. Nobody cuddles them. Nobody shares attention with them. Nobody teaches them what to pay attention to and what is noise, you know, like what's signal and what's noise. What, what do you have to pay attention to? What, what can you ignore? And these kids grow up very impaired. They're physically, their bodies are smaller, even though they are receiving nutrition and and so on but they're physically smaller their brains are smaller their brains are not neurotypical and it's because the metabolic cost of being alone is very high it adds up over time you know like i i sometimes say um you know to my friends <laughs> my daughter i've said this before you know um when you break up with someone, you know, you have a love affair, you break up with someone, you feel like it's going to kill you, but you eventually get over it. But if you actually remain alone for your whole life, it will kill you. It will kill you earlier than, you, you know, you will die earlier than you would have died um, uh, if you had close supportive relationships. So you can decide what kind of person you want to be. Do you want to be somebody who adds to somebody's deficit, or do you want to be somebody who mitigates that deficit? And I, I might even, I don't know if you would agree with this, but take it even a, a step further to say that you are going to be at your best when you're bringing out the best in those around you. Absolutely. And I should also say, Pat, that, you know, I'm not saying everybody has to be nice to each other. Although, frankly, I've decided I don't know what's wrong with being nice. I mean, like being nice is actually okay. I mean, treating people with human dignity is 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 a start you know but you can you can give negative feedback you can give critical feedback you can disagree with people you can disagree with people really quite dramatically um that you can still do it in a respectful way 
that doesn't add a tax. So I'm not saying that this means that everybody has to, you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. You know, if you at, believe me when I say I have 25 young scientists full time in my lab, plus about 100 students, they will tell you, you know, this, the postdoc I had who practiced his job talk two days ago would not say that there is no criticism in our laboratory, <laughs> you know, we, but, but we do, I do other things with them so that they understand that the, the criticism is not of them as a person, it's really of their performance in this job talk because they're gonna face, they have to get used to that feeling and we wanna make their talk as, as good as it can be. So it's sort of criticism, you know, um, delivered with love and respect. Hmm. And um, so it's possible. It's just, you know, it flies in the face of um, uh, some people's ideas about, you know, personal freedom, I think. Hmm. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions that are coming through and maybe I'll, I'll combine a few of them. We have people that are on that have been in a state of chronic deficit, metabolic deficit for a period of time. So um, people that have had, uh, that are actively fighting cancer, people that uh, have suffered from TBI, um, people that have been um, out of work for a couple of years, that have been adversely impacted by the pandemic, divorce, and navigating, you know, managing a, a family at home. So they've been a, in a state of chronic metabolic deficit and, what advice would you have to them if they're looking to update their model, if they're looking to attend to this deficit? Like what's that entry point for them where they can see just a little bit of progress and then maybe build up upon that so that they can uh, crawl their way back? So it's, uh, there actually are a lot of different things that you could do. So not all, all of us don't have the freedom to do every single thing we'd like to do, but we all have more we all have more choices than we think we do this way that I would put it so some people you know not everybody has the same resources. Um, both metaphorically and also actually you know monetarily um, but there are a lot of things that you can do to nudge your body budget back into um, you know be solvent but it's going to take a long time and not everything works for everybody so. It's not a recipe, it's more like a tasting menu. You have to figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So things like, um, you know, um, get, well, we've already talked about, and it's part of, you know, it's part of your program to hydrate and sleep and, and things like that. You know, staying off social media, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, which is very expensive for a human nervous system chaos very expensive for a human nervous system because what that what what that means is they're doing what you have to do when you had that experience with the box you know mm -hmm. you've got to maintain lots of representations at once because you don't know which one is going to be um the one that you need mm -hmm. and you can do that in short spurts but you can't do it over long periods of time. If you if you do, it, it will be very expensive. So what can you do? You can try to reduce uncertainty. You, you can try to um, spend time around people who allow you to be your best self. You can practice awe, making, awe, making an experience of awe for five minutes a day. This is one of my favorite ones because I didn't believe it actually when I first read about it. So, you know, I have a colleague down the hall who studies positive emotions, gratitude, awe, um, compassion, and, you know, how their, their, their positive emotions are really good for you. And I'm just inherently skeptical as a person. And I read the studies and I, I saw the data and I'm like, yeah, okay, I still don't believe it. So, you know, he challenged me. He's like, okay, practice making awe for five minutes a day. And you might be wondering why why would that how will that help me with my body budget well when you experience awe you are a speck and when you're a speck your problems are a speck and so you can it's like taking a very deep breath you just give your nervous system a break for a minute and 
you know, I practiced off for five minutes a day, you know, I'd see a dandelion sticking, you know, poking its ugly little head out of a, you know, cracked sidewalk. And I think, oh, the power of nature to be unconstrained by humans attempt to control it, you know, stuff like that. And I practiced and practiced and practiced and wouldn't you know it? I can experience awe to a dandelion that is just as breathtaking to me as, you know, the ocean or the stars in the sky. I, I, I wouldn't have believed it. I had to try it. I didn't believe the data. I had to try it myself, but there it is. And I can actually cultivate it just like that after a lot of practice, though, I will say a lot of practice. Um, and it gives me a break and literally gives me a break because what happens with awe typically is we sigh and sighing breathing is one way that we can get a handle on our autonomic nervous system so is yoga so is dancing so is singing you know if if you can i mean so there are all these little things that are just nudges and you're just trying to give yourself a little break mm -hmm. and these little breaks kind of add up you can learn new emotion words it turns out the more emotion words you know the more um, options your brain has for um, regulating your actions. And it's like a bigger toolbox. And it turns out, surprisingly to me, I have to say, uh, when I first discovered this, which, you know, the more emotion words you know, the more very precise emotions your brain can make because you're learning emotion knowledge. Um, this is called emotional granularity. And it turns out emotional granularity isn't just doesn't just make you feel better. It like improves your grades, and uh, it means you're more. It, people who are high in granularity are more resilient to illness, and they actually recover from very serious illnesses faster. And when I first, you know, when I first learned about this, because granularity is, I discovered this and I wrote about it, and then all these people started to study it, and then all this evidence, and I was like, you're shitting me, really? Like you can recover from cancer faster? What the hell? that and so you know we started to study it and sure enough you know it's more it's explained i can't really explain the whole all the causal links you know in i mean we're because we're we're pretty much out of time even if you gave me an hour i couldn't do it necessarily uh without props but um it's in the book and it's because when your brain is making predictions what it's when it's it's what it's doing is it's remembering it's it's reassembling memories and sometimes in novel ways um, in order to control your action and create your experience. And um, another way of saying, what is your brain doing? Is your, it's, it's trying to find instances of the past which are similar to the present. Mm -hmm. In psychology, things which are similar to each other are a category. And a mental representation of a category is a concept. So the more concepts your brain can make, the better your brain can regulate your body. And the more precise your experience will be, the more precisely tailored to the situation that you're in. And that's emotional granularity. So you can do that. There are all kinds of things you can do. There's even evidence to show that doing something nice for someone else actually makes you feel better. It actually metaphorically adds uh, to your own body budget, just doing something nice out of the kindness of your heart. So when COVID started, my neighbor, Jerry, who now we're very close, but we didn't really know each other very well. And when COVID started, I decided I'm gonna start baking bread for my neighbors. Now, I, I, not everybody can bake bread for their neighbors. Not everybody has not everybody could break bread. I couldn't bake bread at the beginning of COVID, but me, like, you know, half the people decided they were going to learn to bake bread. You know, I had a 50 pound bag of flour delivered to my house because it was all I could get. There were no pound, there were no like little five pound <laughs> bags of flour. And so I ordered a 50 pound bag. Not everyone can do that. I understand. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is not everybody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Everybody can plant a, a you know, a, you know, plant a flower everybody can you know and have it to look at and it's beautiful everybody can you know 
bake a bread for their neighbor or if they can't bake a bread they can bake cookies or if they can't bake cookies they can just say hi you know and make eye contact and i mean they're everybody can do something and these little things add up over time and you know if they if you need to take drugs you know to to sort of you know borrow from tomorrow to get through today that's okay that's okay that can be part of your regime not everybody needs that but some people do and that's okay because really what you're doing is you're just tinkering around with your own internal um medicine uh cabinet you know man that's amazing i, I what a perfect sentiment to end on this this idea that everyone can do something and that something doesn't have to be a big thing it can be a very small thing and i know um for our members that are on a lot of what we talked about today is going to sound very familiar to you now you have a different um, framework or lens to think about this tending to your body budget through these small acts of getting sleep and hydration and um uh, moving and connecting and getting out of nature and practicing gratitude but this idea that um, we're not individuals we're actually a connected network and uh, we regulate each other's nervous systems for better and worse and that is uh, what a tremendous opportunity uh, that we can exert control in small ways that can bring out the best in those around us and at the same time bring out the best in ourselves so um, just amazing Lisa, um, I know I'm standing between you and dinner, so I don't want to keep you any longer. I'm so grateful for, for you making time to be here with us today and to, uh, for the work that you do and for, for uh, the way that you bring science out of the lab and actually put it into, make it actionable and effective for people to make the world a better place. Now, we'll be sure to share the links out to both of your books, but for anyone that um, just wants to to not dive super deep into the science, but really connect with the stories. This seven and a half lessons of the brain is, is an amazing book. And we'll be running a, a text challenge here in a couple of weeks where we'll put some of these, some of these practices into actions as well. So um, Lisa, maybe over to you for any final thoughts. But again, thank you so much for being here. I well, thank you for having me, Pat. And it's a delight. It's always a delight to talk to you. Um, uh, it's not every day, you know, that I get to talk to a Navy SEAL. So uh you know one of the benefits of this job is i get to meet really really cool people you know like i a couple of weeks ago i met the um one, the wellness coach of the toronto raptors you know i was like yeah that's so cool <laughs> <clears throat> so um i guess the thing that i'll leave you with is that um you you do have more control you have more control than you think you do you don't have as much control as you might like i certainly don't but you have more control than you think you do. And you have more control over um, your own well being and the well being of people around you. And it doesn't actually matter whether you believe it or not. It's just true. I mean, scientists don't like to use the F word fact. It's a very scary word. But this is about as close to a fact as you could get, right? That if you have more control, over your own well being and also the well being of other people, it's not a zero sum game, right? It's then it means you also have more responsibility. And only you can decide. Only you can decide who you want to be. One thing that I do, because believe me, I'm like, I'm not a, um, you know, I'm not, I am not walking around being nice to people all, all the time. I mean, I try, but you know, we all have our days. But I do think often when it comes to, you know, even moments in my everyday life, I sometimes think like, who, when I'm 70 years old, and I look back at my life, who do I want to be? You know, at my funeral, what do I want people to say? I want people to tell the truth. And that may sound really morbid, but it isn't really. What I'm trying to say is the way that you live without regret in the in the moment is to be mindful of who you are and and who you want to be. Like you can't just um, talk the talk; you have to walk the walk. And I don't really. I feel kind of silly telling you guys this because you're all here, so you're not the ones who need to hear it, you know. Um, but. Um, but that's probably the most useful thing I could say to anybody else is that you are you you really are the captain of your own ship, but you're also the first mate, you know, of other people's ships. Perfect. That's amazing. 
Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for spending time with us today. Um, this was uh, just a, an amazing, uh, uh, just so amazing. So I'm so grateful. Uh, it's great to see you all and I look forward to seeing you again soon. I hope you have a great rest of your week. I hope you find ways, small ways to get into action to tend to your body budget and that of others and uh, make the world a better place. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care.